degradation and destruction of the global financial system can be found. And I look forward to speaking with Jim today. Jim, thanks for coming on the show with me. Oh, it's a pleasure being on. I, I like being on different shows once in a while because, uh, you know, it exposes to different group of people, slice of people, segment of the population. Um, I've actually had a pretty decent focus on not just the war in, in terms of weaponry, but war in terms of motive, economic and financial. There's almost always an economic financial motive behind a war. And I've got a pretty decent grip on, on the major wars that are going on right now. Well, I'd love to get into it. Uh, and one of the things that I haven't done a whole lot of research on is Washington's real agenda in the drug trade, the opium wars, specifically in Afghanistan. And if you would, I, I know you're, you understand this very well. I mean, and for those of us who, the fact is we're not seeing this covered on mainstream media news outlets, Fox News, CNN, and uh, this is something that, if it is happening, is absolutely huge. And if you would, if you would just point to a few of the things that we can hang our hat on and say, hey, this is why we are out in the Middle East, at least to a certain degree, uh, regarding heroin and uh, drug drug trades. Okay, let me let me try to cover a number of things without getting into dangerous elements. <clears throat> um, to begin with, most Americans have a wrong conception about Afghanistan, thinking that the U.S. entered that country in 2003. That's not correct. We entered in 2000 when the Russian Soviets exited, the Russians. Uh, we exited because we wanted to take over the heroin trade. Then there was the 2003 event where the big Buddha uh, statue carved into the hillside was blown up and uh, some of the weepy snowflake types in the United States said, well, we need to go over there and you know straighten that place out. <clears throat> right, but also we came up with the false story that Osama bin Laden was behind 9-11 <laughs> when it was really Langley and the Mossad and the, the black hats of the Pentagon. It was an inside job, but it was also a bank heist. Very few people can identify. I'll ask you, what do you think the largest private bank in the world was in 2001, not including central banks? Hmm. Uh, largest bank. What, would it have been bank, bank of America or uh, I, I'll just say. Center. The World Trade Center. Well. The World Trade Center had the largest bank and the largest vault of any private bank in the world except for central banks in early 2001. Why is that fact not known among the general public? Because 9-11 was a bank heist. Mm -hmm. They stole $100 billion worth of gold bars, $100 billion worth of bearer bonds. And I learned in 2007, when I came to Costa Rica and, and developed some more contacts, that there was a third part to that theft. The bank heist also included about $100 billion in, bear, in, in diamonds. Okay, so we came up with a false story about 9-11 to justify invading both Afghanistan and Iraq, but we had already been in Afghanistan three years before. Mm -hmm. This all happened in 2003. The motive for attacking Iraq was also false. That was to hurry up, get in there, steal their central bank gold, and try to clean up all the, the weapons of mass destruction. Remember them? Well, that involves nerve gas and chemical bombs hmm. sold by Papa Bush to Mossad, uh, to Saddam, sorry, Saddam, <laughs> uh, Saddam Hussein. Sure. So I actually met in 2008 a fellow named Brian and here in Costa Rica, and I said, hey, Brian, what have you been doing? I was going to hire him to do some a marketing project. I said, Brian, what, what, were you, what were you doing the last few years? He said, well, I was working for Halliburton. Actually, I was in uh, in Iraq. I said, you were in Iraq, what, the last few years? He said, yeah, yeah, like in 04, 
of 3045. I said, what were you doing there? And he said, we're looking for all the chemical weapons that Papa Bush sold to Saddam. I said, what'd you find? And he said, oh, about 10 warehouses full. And then we came up with the story that we didn't find any. So it was a false motive for going in and a false narrative for the story of what we did when we were in there. Most everything about wars in the news is a lie. Afghanistan produces approximately 85% of global heroin. You have entire battalions of U.S. Army guarding the poppy fields. And I have a client, Patrick Letter subscriber, who's former U.S. military. And he said, Jim, amazing, I signed up for your newsletter. I, I used to serve in Afghanistan. And I said, could you please tell me what problem nonsense does the Pentagon tell the grunt soldiers guarding the heroin production poppy fields so that they continue to guard them? And they said, yeah, they come up with a cock and bull story that, yeah, we're protecting heroin production, but it's all for export to China, Russia, and Iran. So more lies. <laughs> so is it the governments that are benefiting from this trade? No, what? No, no, not at all. You think it's going to go into the U.S. Treasury and offset the deficit? Of course not. It goes into Papa Bush's family business. It's, 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 it's actually called the Association for Past Presidents Fund. Mm. And that's where the Clinton Bush crime family operate. Do you want to take a guess? how much money they have, their net worth from all the heroin? I mean, I would assume it's in the billions. No, you're off by a factor of a thousand. Trillions? Approximately seven trillion dollars. Wow. So why is it Papa Bush mentioned in the Forbes most, most wealthy list? Well, you know, I would ask you uh, just to back up a second. I mean, that's a serious claim, and I've heard that before, the Bush, Clinton, crime syndicate, crime foundation. I mean, what evidence is there to show that they are involved with with drugs and, and this trade? Well, photographs of Bush smoking cigars with certain generals and warehouses with pallets chest high full of heroin, stuff like that. <laughs> I once bumped into a fellow, I won't say where and I won't say the circumstances, but I bumped into him and we hit it off real well and he had some pretty sordid experiences and some very unfortunate personal experiences and I said, how'd you avoid getting killed? And he said, well I had some photographs of Papa Bush smoking cigars with generals in warehouses in the Arab world loaded with pallets, chest high of heroin packs. Hmm. And I sent those photographs to three attorneys. So if they killed one, there'd still be two more. And that's how I got out of my jam. Wow. Essentially blackmailing Papa Bush. So they might have beaten the hell out of me, but they didn't kill me. Well, here's some figures. Um, it's approximately it's between 1,300 and 1,500 tons of heroin a year coming out of Afghanistan. It goes through a certain Air Force base, and then it goes straight to Turkish NATO air base in Encirlik and the German NATO Air Force base at Rammstein to points all across Europe and eventually to the United States. The U.S. also gets its heroin and cocaine from the Colombian districts that are all owned by Papa Bush. He owns their entire banking system. The value of this heroin coming out of Afghanistan is somewhere between 800 billion and 1.2 trillion dollars per year. The costs are largely covered by you, the taxpayer, with the military defense budget, you know, the army grunts guarding the fields, and they're using CIA transport. So again, black bag ops, black bag budgets to move the heroin. One of the stickiest points regarding the uh, failed coup attempt in Turkey several months ago was what's gonna happen with all the heroin shipments coming from 
uh, Afghanistan to points in Europe. So the biggest heroin merchants are Bush and the Langley Black Hats. And to give you an idea of, of the, the depth of the problem at the U.S. street level, in the year 2000, approximately 7% of heroin in the U.S. streets came from, her from Afghanistan. It has gone from 7% to 70%, while the price has been cut by a factor of three. And I personally have a young niece who had a heroin overdose a few months ago, and she's not dead. She made it through. And do you think Papa Bush gives a rat's ass or flying backward shit? No. Hmm. And do we honor Papa Bush? At the beginning of the Super Bowl in Houston, Texas? We sure did. That's how that's how backwards, gullible, dumb, ill informed and stupid the American public is. The man is worth in the trillions for heroin and he was in charge of the project to assassinate Kennedy. And we honor him at the half, I mean, at, at the introduction to the Super Bowl. So, Jim, when it comes to what we're seeing now, I mean, Bush, I mean, this man is, you know, uh, in a hospital bed nowadays. What does his involvement look like now with the current administration and, and the involvement with what we're dealing with right now in the Middle East? Well, it's not his involvement. It's his crime family. It's an organization with several hundred people. Uh, I actually know someone who occasionally talks to their fund managers, and we have interesting talks. I say, well, whose country's banking system are they buying this month? And it sounds like a bad joke, but the answer came back a while ago, Ecuador. So, you know, just with the profits for a month, they bought the Ecuador banks. This is how far-reaching it is. Wow. Uh, Bush personally owns half a million acres in Paraguay. And for those people who are, how should I say, gullible and ill-informed enough to believe that Hitler was killed in a bunker in Bavaria, Eagle's Nest, got news for you. Almost almost, I would say, half of the Argentine adult population is well aware that he lived out his life in Bariloche, Argentina, and just, just to stick a little knife in the side, Hitler had an annual birthday party in Hawaii, because, hey, you know, Hawaii is a nice place. Okay, so Operation Paperclip brought in over a thousand Nazi scientists, bankers, and other smart people, gave them a pass on the war, brought in Mengele to make sure that all of his genetic and human experiments were exploited for Langley purposes. I'm talking about torture and human robots. Brought in Werner von Braun, who's the only one really got the publicity, you know, the, uh, the architect and designer engineer for uh, rocketry and NASA brilliant fellow, but there are several hundred more. Very few people know that Wall Street banks were main funding agents for the German Nazis. Right. So treason, treason is not new in the U.S. government, nor is heroin. The Delano family, as in Franklin Delano Roosevelt, sure. was very involved in the Chinese opium trade. It goes on and on. The Forbes family, as in John Forbes Carey, was very involved in the Chinese opium trade. Well, well, I mean, this trade is not new. I mean, these are serious allegations, and I mean, I, I assume you've followed these things and you've been able to to really back it up. And I'd love to to get into this. I'm I'm going to go back and do a lot of the research and and really try to be in the know on a lot of these things because this is oh my gosh information that would be completely shocking to the average person if they really understood what was going on and well, it's not being understood doesn't know much of anything that's going on ken my joke about the average person is they don't know what fascism is they don't know what money is they don't know what the dollar is 
They don't know what capital is, and they're operating as members within the U.S. economy. Mm -hmm. Well, they think guys like Milo Yiannopoulos is a, a fascist because he's speaking his mind freely at a college, and uh, they twist that into some sort of fascist statement and beat and torture and burn stuff down because they, they don't like what he has to say, and that's the kind of world we live in today. Well, it's getting to the point where anyone who speaks out against the establishment, which might be corrupt, is regarded as a fascist or a, or a Hitler type. What, right. what, what now? I mean, with all this fake news stuff, I mean, CNN is the, the king of fake news. They're calling all the alternative news fake news, and we got some laws. This is a desperation act by the fascists in power. I regard 2001 as the coming out party for the fascists, the neocons. Why would they call themselves neoconservatives, so, you know, like Baby Bush mm. and, uh, you know, Chertoff and uh, Wolfowitz and, and all these guys, Pearl, Richard Pearl, and all these different guys who had their dual Israeli passports. Why would they call themselves neocons? Because Nazi would not have enabled them to get elected. <laughs> so they call themselves neocons. You know, I fell for it for a couple of years, and I started digging more. And I, hey, wait a minute. These neocons, are, they're fascists. Most of them have roots that go back to Nazi Germany, like Bush. Gosh, very few people know that Herman, uh, what's his name? George H.W. Walker Bush. Or H. I'm sorry. Yeah. George H.W. Bush had a father named Prescott who was arrested for trying to do... Uh, a, a, a coup d'etat of Franklin Roosevelt. But they gave him a pass. I think they threatened to kill Roosevelt. It's far more complicated than that because Prescott Bush was, was asked, all right, where do you want to go in the U.S. government just to keep you out of harm's way? And he said, well, let me work with the CIA. It's young. So he started up the drug business. Papa Bush's father, guilty. They should have hanged him. He tried to do a coup d'etat of FDR. But, you know, FDR was pretty dirty in his own way. The Delano family being involved in the Chinese opium trade. It just goes on and on and on. So what is the Bush role right now? Uh, well, pretty much the same as a retired chairman of the board. He's a stockholder. He earns his his cut, you know, on the preferred bonds, and he enjoys a good life. But, you know, I just hope that Papa Bush shits his pants every hour in his wheelchair. Jim, when it comes to what we saw in the, the last election, obviously Trump was an enemy of Jeb Bush. He said a lot of things, and they, they butted heads constantly. Trump beat out Clinton clearly in this campaign and has become president. Do you see him as a disruptor to all these things that we're talking about? Yes. Uh, Trump is, is actually part of a, uh, a military coup. Um, let, me, let me have a little preliminary side story first about Jeb Bush before I get to the, <clears throat> the, the Trump military coup. Remember, Jeb Bush was running in the primaries against Trump, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a, a debate, and Jeb Bush took exceptions, exception to some things that Trump had said about Bush's mother. You remember that? I do. Okay. And, and there was some, you know, weepy press report about, oh, gosh, he insulted my mommy. <clears throat> well, I've had some people insult my mommy, too. And uh, they, they got a push. They got a push in the chest. But here's what here's what knocked out Jeb Bush from the campaign. It wasn't from too much criticism of my mommy. It was from the Russian military interrupting the narco trade going through Saudi Arabia, because the main narco business partner for the Saudis is the Bush family, and the victim was the money line supplying the Jeb Bush presidential campaign. So the Russians interrupted the money flow 
for the Jeb Bush presidential campaign, and he had to drop out. Mm. So wouldn't that have been a more interesting news story to read in the New York Times? Gosh, if the New York Times are shut down tomorrow, and along with CNN, I'll throw a party. <laughs> These are fascist publications and broadcasts for journalism. Well, okay. to, to be fair, on the less conspiracy side, Jeb Bush was not likable. His He did spend millions of dollars, and people were not converting. People were not interested in another Bush. And he spent a lot of marketing dollars to to not convert the voter. Well, that that's probably true. And there's another little side story about Jeb Bush. When his brother, the moron Bush, little George, when he was running for president and the vote took place in 2000, Jeb Bush, as governor of Florida, did him a favor. He did something illegal that was never prosecuted against the governor. If you're guilty of a felony in Florida, you lose your right to vote. But if you've got a traffic violation against you, you're still allowed to vote. But Jeb Bush made over 100,000 black voters ineligible to vote because of traffic violations. Do hmm. you think that helped moron George to win the Florida election? I mean, with or without the hanging chads? Okay, let me get to why Trump is part of a military coup. This is a very dangerous game, Ken. Let me back up to 1995. Do you remember the Sandia Labs story of the stolen weapon schematics I in don't. China? I was a little young back then. Okay. I was not. Uh, I was in my uh, 95, I was in my 40s. Uh, it was a very interesting story. Sandia Labs is a, is a, a, a weapons development uh, location facility in New Mexico. This was probably the first real big sales item by the Clinton Foundation. They sold some some actual weapon systems, including the F-22 fighter aircraft, to China for donations to the Clinton Foundation. And when the Pentagon, I, when I refer to white hats, I mean the good, the good guys. When the Pentagon white hats, the generals, found out about this, they began an impeachment process where the charge was not going to be you know, breaking in the Watergate to steal some papers. The charge for the impeachment in 1995 against Clinton was going to be treason, selling weapons to the enemy through the Sandia Labs with their Canadian charitable organization called the Clinton Foundation taking in the money. Papa Bush was given charge of killing the seven generals who were involved at, with that movement toward impeachment on treason against Clinton, and he put a bomb on a plane that killed all seven in Alabama. A couple months later, the Oklahoma City bombing took place, where the patsy, Timothy McVeigh, was given full credit. Mm -hmm. Let me give a little introduction on chemistry and physics for those who slept through their high school classes. If you put a truckload of fertilizer in front of the Marah building in Oklahoma City on a nice summer day in 1995, you're going to ruin the paint job of the building and you might break a bunch of their windows. But what you saw from that event and that bombing was one-third of the face of that entire building blown off with a hundred pounds of CMAX, blamed on a dumbass little story of a truckload of fertilizer for the morons in the audience who lapped it up like dog shit. Hmm. It was wow. a bombing. Now, so that begs the question, what was the purpose? of blowing up the Oklahoma City Federal Building called the Marah Building. Two, a distraction from killing seven generals 
And if you look at the archives within the Pentagon, you will see no evidence of that event. It was wiped clean. Furthermore, that Oklahoma City building contained records for Fannie Mae for that whole Arkansas, Texas region. Bush, as president, Papa Bush, and had a home in Houston, Texas. Their offices of Fannie Mae in Houston, Texas, to you know, approve mortgages and the like, set up bonds, and, you know, sent them to Washington for approval and sale. Arkansas is the home of Clinton. They happen to both be in the same region for the Oklahoma City building, where the Fannie Mae records were destroyed, where Papa Bush and Clinton stole $1.6 trillion through Fannie Mae. So crime, murder, treason, drugs, heroin, it's not new. It's not a new event. The movement in the Pentagon after the killing by Papa Bush of the seven generals was called America First. Hmm. Now remember, after that event, Clinton went crazy, firing and forcing into, re into uh, retirement a couple hundred generals. And the, the issue was this, are you loyal to the narco barons or are you devoted to the Constitution? The loyalists versus the constitutionals. And if they were loyal to the Constitution, devoted to it, they were fired. And a purge took place that continued with Baby Bush, who got rid of another 150 generals who were devoted to the Constitution. And that movement continued with Obama, who is the third in the line of the neocon fascist presidents. I call it the narco line. All three are drug addicts. Clinton, Baby Bush, and Obama are all cocaine addicts. That's why their medical records are not produced to Congress by law. Wow. So Obama continued the firing, and there were approximately 500 generals and admirals who were fired. Remember, they were fired. They weren't killed. They continued to breathe and make phone calls and meet in Idaho, where the America First movement had its annual conference. Do you remember how many times Trump mentioned America First at his inauguration speech? I seem to remember him saying that quite a bit, but uh, I don't know if it was at the inauguration or at other speeches. It's at inauguration, and it was very much intentional. What was he saying if America First was the Pentagon organization to take back control of the U.S. government and make it a constitutional basis again? Wow. Trump is their champion. Does that explain why four generals are on his cabinet? It sure does, actually. I mean, a lot of a lot of dots being connected here. Do you suppose each one of those generals is a member of America First? I don't know. I pretty much guarantee it. <laughs> wow. Okay, so that's that's what I think about Donald Trump, and he's uh, he's got a very difficult game going because his primary opponent is not CNN. Those are the mouthpieces. His primary opponent is the Bush family and the Black Hats in Langley. Okay. Well, he then does have his work cut out for him. Uh, Jim, I, I want to get to something here, which obviously is all connected. You talked about how the Bush family is purchasing, you know, stocks uh, around the world and, and central banks. Uh, I, I want to get to your thoughts here on this mega trend. What's going on economically and specifically with the stock market? What do you see happening going into 2017 and 2018 regarding stocks? Is a bet against the market a bet against the establishment? Uh, and do you think the establishment is losing ground moving forward here? If you were to make a list of 10 uh, institutions and facilities and markets, the stock market would be number 10 for me, bottom of the list. 
Okay. People care about the stock market because they've got 401ks and IRAs. Exactly. And because the Dow is over 20,000, they remain asleep like, you know, low IQ dogs who don't follow what's going on with the dollar, with the banking system, with international rules, with new non-dollar platforms. They remain asleep to all these important concepts because their stock account is lifted by illicit means from the Federal Reserve and Wall Street banks with phony money. Okay, so uh, I, I what's the trend? Then? I don't really care about the stock market, Ken. Okay. I don't really care about it. I, I hardly ever talk about it in my newsletter. And it's not really important except as the opium to keep the American public asleep. Then what do you see as the, where do you see things headed? You know, where, what is the, the big trend? I mean, where is this culminating here uh, that you're forecasting, you know, going into the, the end of this decade and into, you know, to the 2020s? Well, where are we headed? We're headed to a world where the dollar is not the global currency reserve, where the dollar is going to lose its, its valued privilege. And again, I'm, I'm speaking mostly to people who don't know what even that means. And I, I like to, to try to, to help people along. When I say the dollar is going to lose its global currency reserve and its, its global standard status, I need to explain that because Americans don't know what it means. I, I think 90 out of 100 people don't know what it means. Sure. The first thing it means is a country like, say, South Korea, they might have a couple of hundred billion dollars worth of treasury bonds from all their export trade. They never converted the dollars into local currency. They kept it all in terms of treasury bonds in dollar form and it's used now as the basis and asset foundation for their banking system. It is their global currency reserve serving as the foundation and core for their banking system. That's one side of what the global currency reserve means. The other side is, well, if a country like, say, uh, Saudi Arabia sells a, a few tankers worth of oil, they're paid in treasury bills. They're paid in dollars. And those treasury bills, it, until about two years ago, the Saudis never converted. They just kept them in treasuries and didn't convert them out of the dollar because the dollar was the global currency reserve. That was part of the petro surplus recycle, which is heart and soul of the petrodollar de facto standard. Okay, so for banking purposes and trade payment purposes, the dollar is the global currency reserve and standard. That is going away. And I don't know when. It is inevitable. The steps are already moving in that direction. The platforms for the alternative are already being created. Some done. The movement is there. The Russians and Chinese are trading in oil and not using the dollar. China is dumping treasuries. There have been a total of, in the last 12 months, a total of $410 billion worth of treasury bonds dumped on the market. But you, know, you should know that there are a good seven or $8 trillion out there of treasury bonds in foreign hands. So it's not causing a panic yet, but it is causing a great deal of strain with the derivatives and the machinery run by the U.S. Government Department of Treasury to maintain the Treasury bond market, to maintain the dollar, and just as a little sideshow, they maintain the U.S. stock market to keep the American people asleep. The only time my sister has ever called me asking me for advice on what is coming, what to do, what, what, is, what should I be looking for regarding her million dollar IRA, or I guess 401k, part of a company, the only time was post Lehman 
in the first couple months of 2009. Sure. When there was a problem. The problem only because her stock account went down 30%. But now she doesn't care about anything regarding the dollar, bonds, war, heroin, politics, anything except her job and her cats. Right. Because her stock, his stock account is doing well. And she actually calls me stupid for being preoccupied with gold and the dollar when things are really doing well in the stock market. So again, if there are 10 concepts that are of importance, the stock market is last hmm. on my list. Well, Jim, if you can give somebody, you know, uh, some closing words of advice who has listened to this interview and is concerned about the stock market, is concerned about the dollar, uh, what would your advice be? And, uh, you know, definitely let people know what they will find if they visit you at your website. Well, there was an old saying that once made a lot of sense, but has been forgotten for a long, long time. Sell high and buy low. It's now, in, in the last several years, it's whatever's high and rising, buy. Mm. Whatever's low, even if it has great intrinsic value, sell it, get rid of it, it's trash. There was once a show done in, uh, on, a, on a side street near the, the Los Angeles beaches, probably near Venice. The fellow offered... Uh, a coupon to go into a pawn shop to buy stuff or a 10, 10 ounce bar of silver and no one took the 10 ounce bar of silver mm. Americans don't know what money is I, I've said they don't know what money is don't know what inflation is don't know what fascism is doesn't know what capital is they don't even know what freedom is freedom is the the, the right to take orders and to follow political correctness <laughs> and, and to salute the transgender ex-wife of Barack Obama, born Michael LaVon Robinson, a.k.a. Michelle. Hey, Michelle, you got a penis. <clears throat> okay, the advice I give people, sell high, buy low. What's artificially high right now? The entire stock market, at least, you know, mid caps and large caps. What's propping it up? Well, the Fed with artificial money. It's not just, they're not just buying government bonds. They're propping up stocks so the Americans remain asleep like low IQ dogs. Right. Why are people continuing to be fascinated with Facebook stock and Apple stock and, and Google stock, these are the stocks that are going to falter. I mean, Facebook is nothing but a very, very high-priced rack of disk drives. And it did not meet, meet the qualifications for entering the S&P. I was shocked when Facebook entered the S&P because they did not have a tangible product, which is a prime requirement, to enter the S&P. And then I found out why. Well, he's a grandson of a Rockefeller. Ha! Huh. Mark Zuckerberg is a Rockefeller. Wait, I up, didn't know people. that. Okay, so sell high. Sell your stocks that are kept artificially high during the most fierce, vicious, and raging economic recession since 1930. I believe what we're seeing now is about equal with the Great Depression. Hmm. If you look at real statistics, I don't look at the fascist statistics. Of course. You can't say we got 3% growth, 2% growth, when they claim we have 1.8% inflation, when the Chapman, C-H-A-P-M-A-N, the Chapman Index, based on, I think, 50 different cities and a basket of 500 items, has been running calculations of CPI for the last 12 years, and it's running 8 to 9% pretty steadily every single year. So that means what they claim is the GDP for economic growth is wrong by the amount of their lie. They say it, the inflation is 1.5, and it's really 8, say, conservatively. Well, they're wrong by 7%. 
So when they say the economy is growing by 2%, it's really growing by minus 5. We've been stuck in a recession since Lehman Brothers of between minus 4 and minus 6% every single year. Okay, sell your stocks because they're probably 70% overpriced, overvalued. Sell them. Buy low. What's kept low? Gold, silver. Does anybody who's listening, I, I guarantee there's some, but I think it's an extreme minority. Does anybody listening have the awareness that when it comes to the actual gold sitting in the COMEX and other vaults for sale, the gold has approximately 300 different claims for that single ounce, mm -hmm. 300 times as many demand items as the supply item. Wow. Yeah, no, I, we, we do cover that, uh, okay, and it's good. amazing. Yeah, and silver is something like 70 or 80 or 90 to 1. Okay, so that means the price for gold and silver are both ridiculously artificially low. So sell your stocks and buy gold and silver. Now, let me tell you a quick, quick couple of stories about gold and what the actual price is. I pay absolutely no attention to the COMEX price. It, it might say 1280 or 1310 or something like that. I don't really care because the last time I checked was about three or four weeks ago. I don't care about stocks and I don't care about the COMEX gold price. What I do care about is the voice who is a good source of mine from Central Europe. He's a gold broker and an international consulting agent. The voice told me this was right around the Christmas time, early December, and then he had another story in early January. He said, Jim, <clears throat> there was a sale that I was aware of. Uh, some friend of mine, a, a guy I've known for a number of years, and he bought some gold. I don't want to tell you. I'm not going to say. Uh, where the source was for the gold and he sent me a picture of a bin it was like a like a little mining rail car uh, and the bin had about 80 to 100 gold bars on it and each bar probably was 10 kilograms you know 60 pounds no what was that 30 10 kilo 10 20 25 30 pounds okay and it had about 100 bars on it okay the bin mm -hmm. and he said that entire bin was sold recently, and the price per ounce of gold was $2,100. Wow. And I said, it sounds like it was a sale for around $100 million. And he said, yeah, you know, give or take, yeah, $100 million. So he said, Jim, the price of gold is not $1,300. It's $800 more. So we're, we're talking about something like 60% price premium on the official gold price to buy a large lot of gold. Then he said, if you want to buy a lot of gold, I mean a huge truckload of gold, you need to pay more. And he said, I've got some clients in Hong Kong and they want to buy $500 million worth in, in, like, like in a couple months period. And I tell him, no, 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 you got to space that out over a year. Because to buy $500 million worth, you need to pay $3,000 per ounce of gold. So I asked you, Ken, what's the price of gold? Well, the paper price what is a little over $1,200. No, 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 I didn't ask you the paper price. I said, what's the price of gold? You said $3,000. I, I assume you understand gold is a metal? I do understand that. Yeah, and you okay, said $3,000. what's 3, the price of gold after the stories that I just told? $3,000 an ounce. Between $2,100 and $3,000 per ounce. What's the artificial, concocted, fraudulent paper contract based on suppressed futures contracts? 50 to 75% lower. Can you buy metal gold with the futures contract? Uh, no. No, I mean, you can try to no, get the delivery. Cannot. You cannot. For the last three years, there have been no delivery. You have to convert it to, to the 
to the dollar amount and roll it over. In other words, it's a constantly rolled over fraudulent instrument. Right. The silver price has similar premiums of 100%. So what I'm saying is the silver price is between 30 and $35 an ounce. Okay, here, here's where it gets a little humorous, but real world. If you go to a, a dealer, you know, just, just find the biggest dealer you can find in, in, say, St. Louis or Dallas. You walk in and you say, hey, I want to buy some gold coins. What's your price? He'll say, well, it's $1,300 plus a little premium, you know, tacked onto the official COMEX price. Then you say to him, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you. I've got a guy out back. He's got $20 million in cash in a, in a few different suitcases. I want to buy a lot of gold coins. I, I didn't just mean one or two. Then the dealer will say, well, we've got seven. And you say to the dealer, oh, I'm sorry, this is just not going to work. I, I need to buy a few thousand. Oh, yeah, but we have seven at this price. So I ask you, what's the gold price? 3,000, 2,100 to 3,000. Exactly. And when you can buy a few, like, uh, like say, three coins for 1,300 plus a premium for the dealer, what are you buying? They're real, but what are you buying? Well, you're purchasing at a ma massive discount. You're buying at a massive discount, but you're buying floor scraps hmm. that the elite are tossing toward the low IQ dogs in the crowd who are lapping them up and believe that's the gold price. Whereas the smart ones are taking millions of dollars and buying gold in bar form for over $2,000 an ounce. Okay, the hat trick letter is designed for people who are not low IQ sheep and dogs. It's for that 10% of the population who are enlightened, probably a good slice of your listening audience. This is what the hat trick letter is all about. We don't look to see what's the fast moving stock this month. We look to see what new non-dollar platform is coming into view that's going to knock flat the petrodollar and to serve as the new standard for buying, say, oil and then buying container vessels worth of cargo and paying with gold trade notes. That's what's coming into view, and, and it's a slow process to be sure. But I, I look at monetary policy, uh, some of the correct forecasts in the last few years have been, say, expecting that we would go down to 0% after Lehman. Remember they denied that, and then they did it? Yeah, it happened. And when they did it, and then when they did it, Ken, they said it would only be for a couple months or a few, few months. Mm -hmm, Remember that? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I said it would be forever. And here we are, uh, nine, eight years later. Then I forecasted following that that we would go toward QE to monetize the federal debt and the government bonds because no, no buyers would be out there. And if you look at the, the Treasury bonds, you, you'll see that the main buyers are, are captive audiences like Japan, the Central Bank of Japan, Bank of Japan. Um, so remember when they came out with, with QE? the bond monetization program, bond purchase program, they, they said that it would not include stocks and it would only be temporary. I said that it would be forever, and I really didn't delve into whether it would cover stocks, but later I said, well, obviously it would because that's what's pumping up the stock market. It was an after-the-fact observation rather than a forecast. I made other calls, like uh, here's an interesting one. In December of 15. They claimed, the Fed claimed that they had a quarter percent interest rate hike. They did not. Look at the effective Fed funds contract, and it, it, it showed like seven basis points, not 25. And it's still not showing the 25. What they did was they increased the rate on a reverse repo, which is an exotic sort of thing. But what it does effectively is it takes cash from the big Wall Street banks and it replaces that cash with treasury bonds, which the Fed gives permission to the banks to leverage in ways that they've never done before 
so that they can continue to buy some more treasury bonds and leverage up like the Fed is leveraged up. The leverage at the Fed is, is, is massive. It's like 50 to 1, 60 to 1 or more for their actual assets versus their treasury bond ownership. In other words, they're using a lot of fake money to leverage up the bond market. So sell your bonds. Hmm. They're using fake money to prop up the bonds and fake money to prop up stocks. Sell both and buy coins and bar, bars for gold and silver because when the dollar loses its global currency reserve status, gold and silver may be among the very few asset classes that do well and survive. Wow. Here's my most my, my most intriguing, weird forecast, Ken. I love telling this story. I, I hope we're not going extra long here. Uh, probably a little bit. No, no worries. We got we got a couple more minutes. Okay. In 2011, the voice told me, "Sorry, Jim. I've been talking for two years about Nuremberg banker trials for extreme trillion dollar fraud and financing of war with narco money. It's just not going to happen." We're not going to have any banker trials. We're not going to have any justice at all with the big bankers. Instead, we're going to get them scrambling to survive, and maybe some of them will lose a good deal of their wealth. And I, I piped in, I would think some are going to get killed, wouldn't you? And he said, probably. But that's another story for another day. <laughs> so I put together a theory, and the theory went like this. This was, remember, 2011. This is before any bankers were killed. I said, here's, here's how I think it's going to happen, Mr. Boyce. He has a name. I'm not going to tell him the name or his nationality. He's a, a man from Europe. I said, here's how I think it's going to go. You have the vice presidents. You have the board members. You have the higher levels. You have the you know directors. They're all high level within a bank. And then you have the very low level. And, and, and by the way, the high level, they know exactly what's going on. They know, for instance, that in overnight bank transfers, they do occasionally use a heroin pack that weighs 10 kilograms and is worth very close to what a bar of gold is worth. They are aware of that. They are aware that J.P. Morgan was sold to the Chinese property con conglomerate as part of uh, a U.S. government debt default. They are aware of those things. But the lowest level people like tellers and, you know, bank branch manager, uh, loan officers, whatever. They don't know anything. They don't even know that the mortgage rates are based, for the 30-year mortgage, are based on the 10-year bond and not the 30-year. They don't know anything. They're dumb. They just don't even know their own business. They just show up to work and collect a paycheck and make sure things get done. I've gone to five different banks in the 90s asking them, how do you base your rate? What is it based on for the 30-year mortgage? Every one of them said the 30-year bond. Every one of them was wrong. It's the 10-year. They roll it over. They roll the risk every 10 years. Okay. <clears throat> Where is I going with this? Oh, yeah. Here's the forecast. I said that the middle-level bankers are at risk. They know too much, but they're not high enough ranked. So they're going to be murdered. I said this in 2011. I said, in the next few years, look for a rash of murders of mid-level bankers who were involved in setting up the offshore companies, who were involved in muling the bearer bonds, I mean carrying them, who were involved in meeting very, very scummy people like Vatican figures or Russian mob for investments. And these people know too much, but they're not going to be protected. Not only were they murdered, Ken, but the banks set up insurance contracts on their lives and profited from their murders. Wow. These were not standard life insurance policies. They were like market instruments with a backing of a life insurance policy. So they murdered John QX at J.P. Morgan because he knew too much about the Caribbean setup of Enron and then they profited from his life ending on that life insurance policy 
and told his widow, here's a little $10,000 bonus or some little bone. The banker murders were part of my forecast. Okay, I don't specialize in the, the avant-garde weirdo type forecast. More recent forecasts are that the Italian banking system will collapse, that the Italians and the Greeks together will force a breakdown in the Euro Union and the, and the currency. Uh, and a more recent forecast also is that the NATO Air Force bases and the alliance will be fractured and revelations will come that they're for narcotics transport. I have a, a client who met me in August and uh, he said to me, Jim, I've got a good friend who served in Vietnam and he was at a, a very, very large Thailand-based Air Force base. Okay, so it was close to Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. It's where they moved all the dead bodies. And remember back then it was 200, 300 a week. Mm -hmm. And he said, this friend of mine wandered one day. You know, they have time off. They have their recreation time. They have the off duty. He said he wandered into a restricted zone. And he was met by a major, not a private MP. He was met by a major who said, hey, cadet, or hey, sergeant, or grunt, or whatever you are. Hey, grunt, turn around, get out of here. This is a restricted zone. And the guy said, restricted for what? Isn't this where all the, the co coffins are? And he said, yeah, this is the morgue. Get the hell out of here. So he did a little more digging. And he concluded, based on all he heard and all he saw, 100 pounds of heroin shipped out with every dead soldier in the coffin. So I ask you, do you think the Pentagon really minded that there were several thousand dead soldiers? Well, I, I guess not. No, not, we, we know that there, uh, there's a lot of nefarious things happening. That's a lot of heroin. So the heroin is compliments of the U.S. military and the Central Intelligence Agency, again, to keep the public not just distracted and dumbed down, but doped up. Wow. Well, uh, Jim, I mean, those are, a, we've talked about some things here that have just serious, serious implications. And uh, you know what? I, I hope to, for myself, do more research and... Um, you know what? I, I will be following your work uh, more closely and you know, doing my own independent research as well. So, again, thank you so much for coming on the show with me today and, and educating us on just years of knowledge that you've acquired. And, you know, and thank you for educating people in general because it, it is very important because right now there's so much censorship and uh, so much of an agenda that's out there that people aren't being told what they need to be told and i know you're out there doing your best to get the truth out so again thanks so much well you know when, when we started the show on the preliminary I, I mentioned to you earlier that i really didn't don't like to focus on war and and uh, politics and and related within there is the narcotics and drugs and i want people to know that the hat trick letter which is found on www.goldenjackass.com it is not focused on war, drugs, and politics. I do have a chapter last month and in December, and I will again this month, on the Trump administration and the directions it's going. It's not the political angles. It's the economic and financial directions that it's going in. Uh, the, the one report is called the Global Money War Report, and that's about defense of the dollar continuation of the dollar, um, demise of the petrodollar, the rise of, say, the petro RMB, Chinese contract, Chinese currency. Um, I do focus on, I did a couple of years ago on the Ukraine war and what the real motives were. Uh, they're, they're largely economic. It was to cut off the, the Russian gas from uh, natural gas supply to Western Europe. They, the United States wanted to use fracked 
gas supply from North America and replace the Russians. How stupid is that? I mean, is that wrong by a factor of 10 or is it 20? So we got a lot of lies in the press. Anything you read about Ukraine is largely a lie. We got micro nuclear bombs being used there that are small enough to be called and blamed, you know, the plausible deniability, uh, to be called a conventional bomb. But people on the ground are reporting that the effects are identical with the nuclear radiation because they are nuclear bombs. They're just smaller. Um, <clears throat> I focus lately a, a lot on, on China, Russia, and Iran, and, and to some extent India, for how they're moving toward the Eurasian Economic Union, which I prefer to call the Eurasian Trade Zone, because they're going to adopt a non-dollar standard for both banking reserves and trade payment that knocks out the dollar as the global currency reserve. So this is how the dollar is going to go away or an urgent need will be put upon the American economy for a replacement. And for what? To assure import supply. This is where rubber meets the road for the dollar and the need will arise for a different dollar, a domestic only dollar, because you know, except for to some extent the euro, the dollar is the only currency out there that's used widely on an international basis, but is also a domestic currency for a country, namely the United States. The European Union has the euro, and there is some euro that, that you see in Panama. Uh, there's euro that you see in Switzerland. That's not part of the economic union, by the way, uh, the European Union. And there's, there's some euros I, I see in in Costa Rican banks, but it's very, very minor. So the dollar's gonna lose its privilege. And I, I call it a privilege because we're running a $550 billion annual trade deficit and we're not paying that bill. We're letting it build up every year in the form of foreigners collecting more IOUs in the form of Treasury bill and it's not gonna last much longer I don't know how much longer but it's not gonna last another 10 years it's not gonna last another five years probably not gonna last another three years may not last another eight to ten months so big changes are coming Trump has a huge challenge right now he needs to do his big projects the trillion dollar infrastructure projects, he needs to do that on debt extensions or foreign holdings of treasury bonds or foreign investments. And we got the, the one trillion promise from the Japanese where the tool, again, US government tool running another country, Shinzo Abe in Japan, he has pledged a trillion dollars from their pension fund. He did not obtain approval from the Japanese parliament to use that trillion dollars in such manner. But Trump has worked a deal where, let's see if it happens, don't know. That would be quite an interesting move if a trillion dollars in Japanese money goes to rebuild the infrastructure in the United States with highway bridges, highways, bridges, port facilities, railways, you know, truck rail depots, toll roads oh boy so we got a big challenge with Trump to continue in his economic revitalization plan before the new dollars introduced so this, he's running out of time and I, I don't know how he's gonna pull it off the foreign money is, is a great concept we'll see how far it goes I don't know but what I'd like to see Trump do is start an initiative where 50,000 new companies are created per year with tax breaks and property tax break income tax breaks with the Fed Federal Reserve uh, sorry federal government income tax breaks and property tax breaks and it could happen within the free trade zone so Ken that's that's a summary of the big challenge with Trump to avoid getting knocked off by the black hats within the Bush and Langley 